Good morning and welcome to Friday Morning Webinars brought to you by ActorsFoundryOnline.com. We're going to study today realizations and decisions and I want to specifically talk about the realization and how you have a deep inset realization which invites the audience in and gets the audience to be part of the character. A lot like the Mark Rylance work, uh, if you haven't been watching the Wolf Hall series uh, with Damian Lewis and the very young Tom Holland, you have to watch it. It's incredible because Mark Rylance's work is basically a master class in quiet realizations. Maybe at the end of this talk, I can show you a little bit of footage from Mark Rylance. But today we're going to study a scene from a 2018 film, The Mary Queen of Scots, and look at Margot Robbie's performance and Sorcy Ronan, who are both fabulous in um, their work. But I can show you a couple of moments where Sorcy Ronan is in her head and not quite having a true realization and the um, incredible work done by Margot Robbie in this scene. So we're gonna study a scene from Mary Queen of Scots and then we're going to uh, watch the scene itself and then we'll discuss it. So let's... Mary Queen of Scots and the story of Mary and her relationship, non-relationship to uh, Queen Elizabeth has fascinated people for centuries. And it's really one of the great stories of two great women. It's uh, a very complex historical uh, uh, um, narrative, but it's also a unbelievably powerful question about two definitions of what it is to be a woman. And I think it still sits uh, um, alive and fresh today for audiences, which is why we keep revisiting this story. There's been several movies about Mary Queen of Scots and her relationship with Elizabeth. There's been a very famous play, um, um, Mary Queen of Scots, and and so in this movie that just came out in 2018, which is an excellent film. Uh, so the backstory, uh, so we need to know it. I mean, you should go Wikipedia and look it up, but if a little bit of the story as to why these two women are so uh, fascinating to watch is because in an era that was highly misogynistic, dominated by men and very male-oriented and male chauvinist, you had this extreme rare case of not only one woman ascending to the throne of a major uh, power, but two women simultaneously um, becoming the queens of their own realms, which were, of course, side by side. So um, Queen Elizabeth I uh, is the uh, child of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. And after the death of her sister, uh, the other Mary, um, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, she, who dies, she becomes Queen of England. So she's now Queen of England. Meantime, uh, you've got um, Mary, who's become Queen of Scotland. And Mary is actually was raised in French courts and at one time was the uh, queen bride of the, of the king of France. So she's used to power, she's used to, um, uh, she's used to privilege and she and authority and she's now ascended to the throne in Scotland. The, the uh, contradiction of these two women is what's so fascinating. So every one of these movies or plays always end up playing a scene where they two meet and it was rumored that they met, but no one knows historically whether or not that's true. Um, may or may not have happened, but certainly in our imaginations, it's really wonderful to see. So it, any telling of the story of Mary versus Elizabeth, there's always two parallel plots that finally meet at the end. Um, the differences between these women uh, are amazing. One of them is that Mary is a Catholic and she's uh, raised in the French courts and she is a fierce Catholic and uh, Elizabeth, uh, being the child of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, is a Protestant and the head of the Anglican Church in a time when um, the hold of Protestantism is very, very, very tender and fragile. And we know that not long from after this, Spain uh, tries to invade England and bring Catholicism back to the throne. And so, so Elizabeth is in a very fragile state. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Mary is a woman who uh, has had love, has been deeply in love, has given her her heart, and um, has had a child. Her child is James, who um, we'll talk about in a second, ascends to the throne of Scotland, and um, James IV of Scotland. And uh, she is, uh, was reputed to be absolutely beautiful, angelic, uh, and very feminine. Elizabeth, of course, is famous, uh, iconically famous, for being masculine, for being the virgin queen, for never giving her heart away to anyone, 
or if she did, hiding it. She never married. Uh, she dominated the, the throne. She kept everyone at a distance, and she became a powerhouse of masculinity. She was also uh, scarred by a pox disease, so she had a face that was covered in, in boils and things. And um, due to something that we don't know, she had poisoning of some sort. She lost her teeth. Her teeth went black, and she blackened her teeth in with makeup, and she wore wigs because she had no hair. So you've got this one, one queen, Elizabeth, who's more masculine than masculinity itself, very, very powerful, and learning to um, dominate all the men around her who try to counsel her and take her throne, and she refuses to ever marry. She never has children. Whereas Mary is this feminine figure uh, that has a romantic kind of feel to her, grew up in the lavish flourishness of courts, knew the, the dance of romance, and ended up having a child. So you've got these feminine versus masculine or political versus romantic com conversations that define these two women. Now, the, uh, uh, the history, the fore story, of course, is that Mary, you, it's, it's in the film, but it's in the history, is Mary's actually in the midst of a turmoil in her own country, we won't go into that historically, and she's actually now in exile and escape into England. So she's at the mercy, because it's her uncle who has uh, taken over the throne, and it's a, it's a misogynistic move, and she's now um, throwing herself at the mercy of Queen Elizabeth. In the meantime, uh, uh, Elizabeth is trying to keep the Catholics down and maintain the power of her country, even though everybody's trying to throw, throw her off the throne. And then these two women meet. Now, <clears throat> um, the conversations that we have, therefore, following A, B equals B, A, the conversations are womanhood, sisterhood, romance, um, love, motherhood, effeminity, which is Mary, versus politics, power, authority, and almost a manly a grasp of control, which is, which is uh, Elizabeth. A versus B. And of course, what's so great about this movie, it's really wonderful, is that they posit the question, well, hang on a second. I mean, they don't say if A over B equals B over A, but they, they posit the question, what, is that really true? Mary was not, um, a sweetheart, loving, romantic, open-hearted. She was also a keen political manipulator and powerfully ambitious and also quite, could be quite cruel and domineering and she wanted the power. And Elizabeth has not yet turned into that, you know, the virgin queen with the crazy outfits and she dominates her court and things. She's still fighting with the possibility of love and getting married and giving her heart over to a guy named Dudley. It's a different story. And uh, so underneath her power in politics is actually this romantic woman who's yearning for love and yearning for sisterhood. So you've got these contradictions, politics or power over femininity, womanhood, sisterhood, and then, and then that's over here, politics over power over sisterhood, and you've got sisterhood over power. So what's great about the film is that Mary is actually rather a manipulative, conniving little rat, and Elizabeth is actually a quite open-hearted, desirous woman. It's only at the end of the film where those roles get really played into, into um, cemented into play. And then Elizabeth becomes that virgin queen. And Mary, so the four story is, Mary um, is, uh, lives in England in exile from Scotland and is under the protection of the queen, but she ends up constantly trying to take the throne because she thinks in deep down that she has more rights to the throne uh, that's a lineage thing than the Tudors, which is, you know, Henry VII, Henry VIII, and Elizabeth. The Mary actually comes from the line of Edward, I think, and that's why she's actually got more rights to the throne, so she thinks. So she thinks she should be the Queen of England. She's actually a Catholic and conspiring with the French and the Spanish and the, um, and the, uh, what's left of the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and, um, that's history. <laughs> and, uh, and so she's actually caught treasonously writing letters and trying to foment rebellion and actually knock uh, Elizabeth off her throne. So Mary, Elizabeth ends up doing one of the most uh, outrageous and audacious acts in history, which is she executes the monarch of another throne because she's too much of a threat. So the end of the film, the end of the story of Mary and Elizabeth historically is that Elizabeth has Mary beheaded. 
Um, historically, we know that it cost Elizabeth a lot to do so, and it's very difficult. So in the end, power took over the sisterhood, yeah? And then the, what, why, why people are obsessed with the story is because there's an irony to it. Elizabeth defeats Mary, and Mary is destroyed, and Elizabeth becomes this manly figure, and to do so, she has to hang on to her, her throne by never uh, marrying anyone and giving away her power. Therefore, she never has a child. And when Elizabeth dies through the lineage, the next in line to the throne is Mary's son, James, James IV. So even though Mary loses this whole thing and ends up losing her head, in the end, her child, which is the child of her romance and love and womanhood and motherhood, ends up becoming the King of England. And that irony is so powerful that it's, it's just, you know, propagated this story over and over and over again. People can't get enough of it. So there's your backstory to this film. Okay, to our scene. Before we start, there's a little funny anachronistic mistake in the movie, which I think they made a decision to do, but um, they have uh, Mary speaking in a Scottish accent because she's Mary, Queen of Scots. But um, Mary actually would have spoken French. She was raised in the French courts, married to the French king, and she was a European nobility, so she spoke French. She probably didn't speak English. I would imagine she didn't speak English. She certainly didn't speak Gaelic, and she absolutely would not have had a Scottish accent. Um, she would have had, if anything, a very heavy French accent. Uh, probably she and Elizabeth would have been speaking in French. Now, it's an English movie, so they have to speak in English. But um, really, Cersei Ronan should be playing the character with a French accent. But I think they decided that would have confused the heck out of audiences because she's Mary Queen of Scots. Um, but in this, in this scene, she actually does say, uh, uh, we'll speak in your language in a, in a French accent, in French. And, um, and uh, uh, I think the original writer would have had her in a French accent, but you know, there we go. So here we go. This is the scene. Um, Elizabeth and has set up a meeting with Mary. She's asked for a meeting, but Elizabeth doesn't want anyone to know, can't have anyone know that they have had a meeting of any sorts. Um, politically, she needs to keep herself as far away from Mary as possible, but she uh, ascends or uh, acquiesces and decides to have a meeting with her. It's okay. She lies to the people she's with, and then she set up this meeting in a, in a sort of a cottage. It says forest cottage, but it's like this kind of like cottage where there, someone's been washing sheets. And so the two women are on either side of these sheets, this divide, and they can't see each other. And the whole concept for Elizabeth is we can't see each other. Because if I don't see you, then I won't lie or perjure myself when I say, no, I never saw Mary. But she won't, of course, say that I'd never met Mary or hadn't seen her or heard her speak. But there you go. So uh, Elizabeth enters. Da -da -da, um, they retreat back to Mary. Mary leans forward, attempting to get up and meet her, but remaining where she's instructed. Back to Elizabeth, her heart is pounding too. She takes several steps forward. Mary's footfalls draw near, floorboards creaking, then they stop. Mary listens for a moment. Still, should she say something? Elizabeth, frozen, she's building the courage to confront Mary. Finally, Mary says, cousin? And we intercut between the two in separate spaces, hearing but not seeing each other. Elizabeth, barely audible, says, I. So Mary sets the tone. She sets the objective. She's the one that opens up the conversation. Um, she's the one that needs to have the meeting. And she says, cousin, and she breaks the ice. Therefore, we know Mary's going to lose the scene. Elizabeth, barely audible, responding, not the powerful queen, uh, seems kind of shaken and something's going on, at least vulnerable, we'll find out in a moment. And uh, that leads us to think that she's in the negative, which she is, and she will win the scene. Elizabeth swallows down her anxiety, steadies herself and louder, and she says, are you well? The question's gonna be, why is Elizabeth anxious so much, so anxious? Why is she so nervous to meet this woman? Mary, Mary desperately wants to get to her, but holds back. She doesn't wanna do anything to offend Elizabeth. Your voice is not what I expected. What did you expect? I don't know. And then Elizabeth says, vous préférez que nous nous parlions en français? Would you rather we speak in French? And Mary says, we are in your country, I shall speak your language, all of which was cut in the film. She waits for Elizabeth to respond, but she does not. So Mary takes a step closer. So Mary's still initiating an objective, how I long to see your face. But she stops short of revealing herself. Elizabeth says, no one can know we meet. Mary says, yes, I have been instructed. Now that's very interesting use of words. She's probably doing so quite subtly, but I've been instructed. 
This is a queen. She is noble blood. She is the queen of Scotland and was once the queen of France. Um, yes, I have been instructed, has a certain like mm, resentment to it. There's a little bit of a like someone condescended to tell me what to do when I'm the queen. You know, like you've given me orders, but Mary's it's gentle about it, you know? But Elizabeth pushes the subject. If you speak to a, to, of it to anyone, I shall deny and I will regard your words as treason. I will regard your words as treason. So Mary goes, am I your subject now? I'm like, am I your subject? I'm, I'm a queen of Scotland. I'm not English. Am I your subject? How can I have treason? And Elizabeth softens. No, you are not my subject. But you seek refuge. You're looking for something from me, right? So swallowing her pride, Mary says, I am grateful for your protection. They are so close, but still cannot see each other. So, so far we've got... Uh, Mary is sucking up to Elizabeth because Mary needs help. She's in trouble and she's uh, in exile. And she, what she wants to do is ally with Elizabeth and the two of them. Two women could, you know, take on the world and rule the world. Um, and that's what she's really seeking. But at the same time, you can already see her swallowing her pride and getting her fur rising over the idea that Elizabeth is more powerful than her. And what we're getting is Elizabeth is actually quite anxious and quite nervous and very vulnerable. So we're like, what is going on here? Then Mary says, how did it come to this? Elizabeth does not have an answer. And then she says, may I see you, sister? Elizabeth doesn't answer, she's frozen. So she's so scared or something's happening in her that she doesn't do anything. Mary waits, but with no response, she steps into the same space as Elizabeth. As she does, Elizabeth turns, so her back is to Mary. So in the first section of the, of the, of the scene, they can't see each other. In the second, I think, act, we'll see of the scene, uh, when Mary enters the curtain, Elizabeth turns. So now it's her to her back, right? As she does, Elizabeth turns her back. Elizabeth brings her fingers to the side of her wig, making sure there are no underlying locks out of space, place. So you go, oh, well, that's interesting. What's that? She suddenly does the, like a nervous little, almost girly thing where she's like uh, self-consciously checking her hair. And she says, my eyes are weary from travel, has some kind of weak excuse as to why she's not looking at her. Mary gazes at Elizabeth's back. Now Mary throws her bone. I should have stayed true to your love. I should have followed your example and never married. So Mary's saying, I should have been you. I should have been uh, motherless and I should have been uh, husbandless and I should have stayed powerful. I should, have, I should have followed your example. So Mary goes, I really should have been you, counterpoint. And Elizabeth goes, but then you would have no son. Elizabeth's counterpoint. Elizabeth's saying, but, but your mother. So they're both saying, you've got what I don't. Mary says, whom I've not seen these past years, whose mother is without crown and whose own throne is usurped by his uncle. Elizabeth still has her back to Mary and she starts to get political on her. You must have faith your brother will keep her, his word. And Mary says, I have no faith in him. I have only faith in you. So we're getting our two conversations very clear now. There's politics and there's sisterhood. On Elizabeth, closing her eyes, she can guess what is to come next and it's a difficult matter. Mary takes a few steps closer. Now Mary makes her pitch. You would let them show the world that a queen can so easily be forsworn. The uncle, her uncle has dumped her off the, 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 the throne, so she's been forsworn. And Elizabeth, who's a queen in a male-dominated, king-dominated world, has a very like tenuous, very fragile hold of her own throne. And so Mary's going, are you just going to sit back and let that happen? Because if you let that happen, what does that say about you? So Mary's getting political. And she says, answer me, sister. So then Elizabeth says, okay, if we're going to talk politics, we'll talk politics. To war with Scotland and betray my own clergy on a Catholic's behalf? No, I cannot. You know I cannot. I can't go and start war against your uncle to put you back on the throne, which is for a Catholic. My Protestants who are backing me would never, never accept that because the Catholics are the enemy. So Mary goes, did you come so far at such great risk only to refuse me? And Elizabeth goes, I came because... And then she can't finish the sentence. Why did she come? Why did Elizabeth come? I came because, why, she can't finish the sentence. Interesting. Now I know why, we'll talk about it in a second. Mary says, if you refuse me, say it to my face, don't force me to beg to your back. 
Now we get into, they finally face each other off. Elizabeth turns and they take each other in for the first time. This is the first time these two women have ever met. They have a huge bond because they're both women in a men's world running a country, but they've never seen each other. And then this line, which would be intensely hard to act, but we see pride and humility on both their faces, anger and love, compassion and antagonism, a kaleidoscope of contradictions. Then eventually, I will kneel before you if I must. So Mary's getting humble. And she's saying, look, I'll humble, I mean, I'll do anything. I'll beg if you need me to beg. And Elizabeth goes, it would make no difference. You are safe here in England, but that is all I can offer. So Elizabeth is saying, look, you're safe. I won't do anything to you, but you can't, I can't do anything politically. So Mary cannot contain her emotion any longer. Her frustration, anger, and sorrow and despair rises up. And she says, I have been abandoned by so many, I am utterly alone. And Elizabeth goes, as am I, alone. So now they've got this bond. They're like very lonely women in a world of dominated by men and dominated by power and politics. And they can really use each other. The sisterhood is really powerful. So Mary sees her moment and pitches, then be my sister, be my boy's godmother. Together we could conquer all the, those who doubt us. Do not play into their hands. Our enmity, our anger, enmity, en enemy-ness, our enmity is precisely what they hope for. I know your heart has more within it than the men who counsel you. So she says, so come on, jump on. That's her pitch, that's her objective. She's now playing it, she's saying, Join me, let's join together. Which is a little ironic because Mary has nothing. She has basically a, a serving maid and she's been thrown out of her own country. And Elizabeth has her country uh, and she's got her power. But Mary's saying, join with me, let's conquer Scotland. I'll take over the throne and the two of us can, you know, but it's not possible, like it's not possible. One, because mm, Mary's Catholic and Elizabeth's uh, Anglican. Uh, two, because <clears throat> to go to war with Scotland is too expensive and not the right thing to do and would uh, trigger a war in France and Spain. But also because uh, um, Mary's got a claim to the throne and Elizabeth doesn't trust her. So let's move on. Elizabeth goes, I am more man than woman now. The throne has made me so. There's her subject, that's her uh, AA conversation. But I have no enmity with you. I have nothing but compassion and empathy with you. So that's her B conversation. And now we see the real Mary go and come out because what's happened is Elizabeth has basically made it clear that there's no way that Elizabeth is going to help Mary. So then Mary goes, except to see rebellion and deceive me time and time again, which is a, which is a, uh, a, it's a blame, it's an attack, it's uh, a criticism, but it's basically, um, it's calling her out, right? But it's very, very dangerous conversation to, to throw at her. So Elizabeth goes, whoa. And now Elizabeth is Queen Elizabeth I of England. She goes, you would do well to watch your words. Like be careful the way you speak to me. Because don't forget, I still have the power. I could have you exiled out of this country. I could have you executed, which I'm gonna do. I could have you um, arrested, like don't, or I could give you everything you want. Like don't, don't attack me. And then Mary's true colors show up. Her counterpoint blows out. I will not be scolded by my inferior, my inferior. And that's when Elizabeth goes And now the whole scene goes and falls into place. So what we've got so far is Mary's objective is to call on the sisterhood and the love and the um, connection, cousins, she calls her cousin and sister and, and, and um, uh, as a mother and as a romantic woman who's been in love and a woman who's alone and a, and a woman who feels like she's calling on Elizabeth to bond with her and team up with her and ally with her. And it's seemingly for on the, the guise of, we're both women, let's be women together. But underneath what's really happening in her counterpoint, Mary, is that she's a political animal who has resentment, who has entitlement, who wants authority and power and she's manipulative and she actually wants to take Elizabeth down, so it's politics. So the reason for this meeting, though it seems to be about sisterhood, is really about gaining power for Mary. For Elizabeth, the, sister, the scene's about politics and power. Look, I'm the queen of England I'm, and basically I'm gonna give you safe refuge and you can have a castle and live in it, but that's all you're getting and it's all politics, man. We have their different religions, different states, there's different alliances going on, I can't help you, 
right? And also, you know, you have a claim to my throne, so you're actually a danger to me. So you can live in my country and I'll leave you alone, but don't mess around. So that's all power. But why, why can't Elizabeth just send a letter? Why didn't she send an envoy? Why didn't she send uh, just a courier dude with like a little scroll that says that, you know? She comes to meet her. So why did she come to meet her? And up here, back here, where she's like, I came because, uh, hmm, why did I come, you know? Where's that line down here? I came because, Elizabeth came because she's yearning, yearning for the love of, uh, of a fellow woman, of a companion, of someone who'd understand. Nobody in the, on the planet understands Elizabeth. No one understands the pressure she's understand. There is no, no one. And weirdly, there is one, this woman, who's also a queen of a country, who's also being manipulated by men. So I came because I wanted to meet you. I wanted to be friends with you because I'm lonely. And down here, she's, as am I, alone. She's basically saying, you know, yeah, like I need you too, as am I alone. And Mary's jumping on, Mary's jumping on Elizabeth's counterpoint, right? Whereas Elizabeth, discovers Mary's counterpoint in the scene, which is Mary's, so Elizabeth is there because she's got to teach her politics and put her in her place, but she's really there because she yearns for a sister. Mary's there because she needs to ally with a sister and have a friend and have, a, have someone who will help her and be together and work with her, even though what she's really doing is she's trying to manipulate the system and save her ass and get Elizabeth to be a political ally and work with, with her in a political way. And so we get the truth here, and this is where Elizabeth drops her counterpoint and, uh, and wins the scene on her point. You're inferior and Mary's truth comes out. I'm a steward, which gives me greater claim to England than you possess. Boom. That's when Elizabeth goes, major realization. Oh, that's what this is all about. So Elizabeth brings a hand to her wig and she takes off her wig. I had this made because I wanted to present the best version of myself. Her hair is like matted. She's losing hair. You know, she's got a poxed face and she shows off who she really is. So now we know why she didn't want to show her face in the first place. She's humiliated by who she is and she's intimidated by Mary's womanhood and beauty. And she turns over, she takes off the wig and she lets herself be ugly in front of her. I was jealous, your beauty, your bravery, your motherhood. So Elizabeth is saying her counterpoint. You seem to surpass me in every way. That is her counterpoint. And then a beat and then coldly, wait till you see um, um, Margot Robbie's performance. And then coldly she says, but now I see there was no cause for envy. Your gifts are your downfall. And we get back to politics. She tosses the wig on the table. Mary is shaken, but tries to maintain dignity or held high. So she says, what now, sister? And Elizabeth goes, all politics. You have my protection on my terms. And Mary goes, until you have me killed. And she goes, I will do no such thing. She goes, wouldn't you, as Henry killed your mother? That's Anne Boleyn, right? I am not my father. His blood is your blood. And that's so, now she's getting accusations thrown at her. She's being attacked. We see the real Mary. The real Mary is actually a manipulative, conniving little political animal. And Elizabeth goes, what did I come here for? I came here to try to make a friend. And instead I'm realizing, I came here to meet a sister. And instead what I've discovered is that I have a political enemy. So Elizabeth drops the hammer. As long as you do not provoke my enemies, you have nothing to fear. Your fate is in your own hands. And the scene ends there. Elizabeth wins, but Mary adds this, which is just adding fuel to her, you know, fire to her execution. She's basically lost the scene, so she may as well just unveil all of her counterpuntal truth. And her real truth is, if I seek to help your enemies, if I end up becoming your enemy, if I become a treasonous, if I try to destroy you, it's only because you pushed me into their arms. You, should you murder me, remember you murder your sister and you murder your queen. And so we see the true colors of Mary. And there, in the very last moments of the scene, we see the, the point and the counterpoint of the scene, the two conversations, sister versus queen. And that's the two conversations. Queen versus sister. Queen, even though I need a sister, be my sister even though I'm your queen. So queen versus sister, or political survivor versus romantic love. And it's two sides of womanhood in these two extreme women. And it says so much about 
how to balance that and be a woman in a modern day, let alone with the, with the pressures that they had on them. That's the scene. Okay, so let's amazing. watch the scene. Uh, here we got Margot Robbie, absolute genius. Now this is the last third of the scene. Uh, I, th I think the three acts of the scene are probably, they don't look at each other, she's got her back to her, and then they look at each other, that seems right. But um, in the scene, it's Elizabeth basically goes, I can't do anything about this, she wins. And then Mary's desperate plea of, come on, be my sister, and then she wins. And then in the third act, she drops the, the, the truth comes in, it becomes all politics, and that's when Elizabeth goes, oh my gosh, what have I been doing? And then we have the denouement of the scene, which is, you know, it's all politics. So it's the three acts of the scene. So this is the moment where she takes her wig off. I am more man than woman now. The throne has made me so. Look how vulnerable she is. But I have no enmity with you except to seed rebellion and to deceive me time and time again. If you still seek my protection, you would do well to watch your words. I will not be scolded by my inferior. Boom! Your inferior. I am a steward, which gives me greater claim to England than you possess. Realization, decision. That's like one of the nicest realizations and decisions I've seen in a while. Although watch any of Mark Rylance. Look how vulnerable she is so. in this moment. But I have no enmity with you. She, look at her eyes. She's yearning for her. That's this woman's counterpoint, not her point. Her point is there to be political, but her counterpoint is I'm desperate for this, this love. I'm desperate for this connection. So she's like, I don't have any, en I don't have enmity with you. You're not my enemy. I just, I'm stuck politically, but she goes, I just, I, I need a friend. Look at those eyes, they're yearning, they're so desperate, you got that? And then she says. Except to seed rebellion, and to deceive me time and time again. Now that's an accusation, and this is the Queen of England. So now look at Margot Robbie's response. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's a serious realization. And her realization is, uh, hang on, uh, don't, turn this political, I'm trying to be a good sister to you. So now she's, she warns her, hey, 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 I'm the Queen of England, don't talk to me this way. If you still seek my protection, you would do well to watch your words. I will not be scolded by my inferior. And that, right there, now you see, you see this, that's a lovely moment that Saoirse Ronan's having, which is like, you know, she, see how she takes, took a superior? Even right now in that frame, she's the superior moment. She's up above, you know? She's like, don't talk to me that way. Yo, you know, but she uses the word inferior. You're my inferior. Now, wait a second. What is happening? And now we know what's really happening inside of, of um, Mary of Scots. And Margot Robbie's realization of what am I doing here trying to be friends with this woman who wants to destroy me comes out. And look at this realization. Look at that. You're inferior. I am a steward which gives me greater claim to England than you possess. And that's her truth. And now look at that frame. Look at that frame of realization. She's, in, she's ingesting this information, trying to deal with it. She's like, what? Who are you? What have you done? Look at, that's 256. Look at that versus this. Woman now. Look at the, the lovely yearning. And look at that frame. See that frame? It's yearning and beautiful. And then look at this frame. Oh my God, I just realized who you are and what you mean to me. So watch this again. Watch, oh my God. And now a decision. The decision is, why am I trying to be? I to say, because I wanted to present the best version of myself. Jealous. Your beauty, your bravery, your motherhood. You seem to surpass me in every way. Now watch the switch. That was that was her counterpoint. Now here's her point. 
Now I see there is no cause for envy. Your gifts are your downfall. Boom! Like she just does this huge switch. I want to highlight something which I find very interesting is Margot Robbie basically channels Judy Dench's voice. Listen to her, she sounds just like Judy Dench, who of course played Elizabeth I. I had to say, because I want the best version of myself. If you played me that audio track, I would be convinced that that was uh, Judy Dench. I was jealous. So she's like becoming Queen Elizabeth here, the powerful virgin queen, right? And then she says, watch. Beauty. My counterpoint. Bravery. My counterpoint. Your motherhood. My counterpoint. You seem to surpass me in every way. So she confesses her truth. And then watch her cover it. Realize, what am I doing? And now, boom. Now boom. I see there is no cause for envy. And now she drops the ball. This is the beginnings of the hard-assed queen politics. Your gifts are your downfall. Oh, what an amazing moment. That switch is amazing. That was Academy Award winning top notch master acting right there. What now, sister? Realizations and decisions. Now, watch how she goes cold and fierce. You will still have my protection under my terms. Until you that have That is an killed. amazing switch. I would do such thing with you. Has Henry killed your mother? I am not my father. But you share his blood. Now she goes, okay, I've done with you. I'm done. You're over. She takes a step in. You do not provoke my enemies. You have nothing to fear. Like, that is so amazing. Watch that. That frame. Look at that frame from these opening frames. That is an unbelievable arc. Isn't that a great, great, great performance? As long as you do not provoke my enemies, you have nothing to fear. Your fate rests in your own hands. Boom. Then we get the final absolute truth. This is who she really was the whole time. If I seek to help your enemies, tis only because you pushed me to their arms. And should you murder me, remember you murder your sister. And you murder your queen. And we go, oh, that's who she is. She's not a loving, romantic sister who wants to be friends and hold hands and, and work out together in order to protect us. She wants the downfall of Elizabeth. And we go, oh, she's a really manipulative, cold, slightly hateful person. You get it? She plays the one thing, but she's the other. And that's point versus counterpoint. Realization, oh, you are dead to me. And decision, I'm done with you even though it hurt. So Elizabeth wins this meeting. She comes to this meeting to figure out who is this woman, what does she want, what can I do for her, and politically how do I you know, encapsulate her and make sure that she doesn't uh, become one of my enemies. But that's not why she really came. Uh, but that's why she came in her head, in the actual point. And so her objective is to um, isolate understand and then um, compartmentalize her possible enemy. At the end of the scene, she completely wins. Now she's unveiled who Mary really is, what Mary really wanted, and she knows exactly what's gonna happen and she's going to um, keep Mary incarcerated and then until Mary finally blows it by sending letters about destroying and, 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 and assassinating Queen Elizabeth, which causes her to lose her head. So she wins the scene, politically. But when she walks out, she breaks down crying because she just lost the potential only friend and ally she'll ever have. And we know that Elizabeth I will spend the rest of her life essentially very, very, very lonely. No husband, no lovers, and no best friends, and no women close to her. So that was her one chance at like sisterhood. And then Mary's objective is look, throw myself at your mercy and say, I'm your sister and we are so alike and no one understands us but you and me, and we should bond and be together and work together. And that's her objective, which she completely loses because she uh, loses her head, you know? So we know that at the end of the scene, she's lost. But the, the problem is that she has this arrogance. She has this, this like 
compulsion to power, which is her counterpoint, which she just can't sit on. And we see little flares of it at the beginning of the scene, you know, just little ones like, uh, 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 you know, as I have been, what's the, what's, what's she say in the script? Um, in the beginning of the script, yeah, as I have been instructed, as, as what am I, your subject now? So we see little flares of her counterpoint. And then by the end of it, we see the full truth of this woman. So, so Elizabeth comes in so powerfully in her counterpoint. She's vulnerable, she's open-hearted, she's weeping. She can't even see her face. She touches her hair like a little girl, you know? And uh, cause she's like nervous and she's intimidated. And, and um, by the end of the scene, the queen is like twig off, ugly, political, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill you. And then that's her arc. And then the Mary's arc is, um, look, I'm your sister, love me, can I see your face? How did it come to this? And by the end of it, we see her truth come out, which is her counterpoint. So the, the scene just does this beautiful inversion. So the conclusion of this study is realizations and decisions are born of the point and counterpoint of the scene. The realizations and decisions, the major realizations and decisions are flips on the counterpoint and born of the scene analysis and the construction. And if you understand that, then you will, you will not have to work at them. You will allow them and permit them to happen because they're intrinsic to the scene. And if you understand the scene and emotionally prepared the scene and work the scene out, you just need to get out of the way. And those realizations and decisions will occur, will actually occur. And when they actually occur, you don't have to act them. You are them. And because you are them, the audience becomes part of that. And you become part of those realizations and decisions. Should you not have done your homework, then your realizations and decisions are gonna be constructed, are gonna be at weird times, are not gonna make any sense, are gonna feel false. And they're also gonna push the audience away. And in this scene, ready? We have examples of both of that because Margot Robbie's decisions and realizations are exactly on script, we just studied the script, and so honest. And Cersei Ronan, who's a fine actor, has a little faky moments and pushes some realizations and decisions which are not in intrinsic to the script. This realization. Realization, look how There's deeply I'm part of this. Provoke. There's her decision. Drop down the hammer. Nothing to fear. That's an amazing realization decision. And there's one over here, of course, which is... Oh, I see, there is no cause for envy. It's right here. Good. Bravery. Come on. It's when... I was jealous. Hang on. Yes. I wanted to be there so... it is, there. It's this one. When Cersei Ronan's character, Mary of Scotland... Which gives me greater claim to England than you possess. ...calls her an inferior and says, I own the... The, the throne. Look at that realization. Oh my God, what have I done? Oh my God. You know what? I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm going to drop this mask and I'm going to decide to lay down the hammer. Those are amazing realizations and amazing decisions born of the script that we just studied. Yes? Now, watch this one that's coming up. This one that's coming up uh, by Circe Ronan is not born of the script goes against the moment in the text and is uh, fakey. And I don't buy it. And it's, it's, I think, jarring as opposed to, now these are great actresses and they're doing their best work, but Margot Robbie's are so real. And then Circe has this kind of fakey one, watch. This. I don't buy it. The lip thing. It's like something you do in a bad theater scene study yes. class. She seems self-conscious about it. It's fake. I was jealous. Don't buy that at all. And the reason why it doesn't make any sense that moment is because um, she wouldn't marry of Scotland, emotionally feel vulnerable and sorry for the queen. Way. We know that her counterpoint, her emotional truth, is that she hates this woman and she's gonna destroy her because she's a Protestant and because she's a tutor and because she's sitting on the throne and she has the power to help her. So she's been pretending to want sisterhood, but her emotional truth is, I want you to die. So when she takes the, the, the wig off 
Mary of Scotland should, according to script analysis, actually quietly reveal a celebration. Just quietly be go, oh my God, you're horrible. Or be disgusted by her, or feel empowered by that, or feel above her. That's her counterpoint. So to look away in this kind of extremely fakey sort of side glance is uh, not only... I was jealous. Where is it? The little eye twitch and then the lip thing. It's all kind of faked. And the reason why she's pushing that moment is because she's not having a real realization. And the, real, the reason she's not having a real realization is because she's contra-textual. She's off the text. She's not inside the text. And when you're not inside the text, you're gonna have to do something. So you're gonna fill it up with a bit of artifice. It's a tiny little moment in an otherwise wonderful performance. But I wanna highlight the difference between authentic, honest, script-based realizations which an actor doesn't need to act, they can just sit inside of and allow happen because they understand the story and pushed, choice-driven, uh, uh, ego-driven realizations which never include the audience and shut us off. That's what these are about. Beauty. Your bravery. Your mother. She has an internal realization. You seem to surpass me in every way. Right here. She realizes, look, I'm giving too much. I shouldn't be doing this to her. Nope, I'm going to go cold, and I'm going to... Now I see there is no cause for envy. Your gifts are your downfall. That moment right there is one of the best moments ever. And when you go to the script, and you study the script, and you say, let's look at that moment, okay? What is, what's written on the page? She says, you're inferior, I'm a steward, she gives, gives me. Elizabeth brings a hand to her wig. I had this maid, she takes off the wig and stares at it. I was jealous, your beauty, your bravery, your motherhood. Never in there does it say, Mary looks down and breaks down crying and can't look at it, right? Mary is shaken, tries to maintain her dignity, but Mary's not shaken by the fact that her hair sucks and that she, uh, is an ugly woman, Elizabeth. She's shaken by the fact that Elizabeth turns cold and now is like, no, I'm gonna destroy you, I'm powerful. So what she's shaken by is her own lack of power and the fact that Elizabeth is so much more superior to her as a politician. When the wig comes off, Mary should have a moment of confusion and potentially just a little bit of pity, but, but mostly a feeling of, of um, superiority because she's the more beautiful. That's actually her counterpoint. And, but watch this. I was jealous of your beauty, your bravery, your motherhood. She looks up at Mary. She, you seem to surpass me in every way. And then there's a realization of I'm giving away too much and then a beat and then coldly, now I see there's no cause for envy and then your gifts are your downfall. That's exactly what's written on the page but no one has ever done it and no one will ever do it again like Margot Robbie does. That's, that's exactly what's on the page and she kills that moment, right? So conclusion, realizations and decisions are the whole art form of acting. Your realizations have to include the audience. We're part of the realization. For the audience to be included in the realization, it has to be an actual real realization. Those real realizations occur because you have studied the script until you're blue in the face. We barely touched the analysis. We'd have to spend two, three, eight hour days breaking down that script to make sure that we understand each and every moment. And because you understand each and every moment, then you can't help if you're emotionally prepared and focused out of yourself and shut your ego down. You can't help but become the character in those moments and actually have that real realization which involves the audience. If you're not really inside of the script, haven't quite done your homework, and you're not really completely cemented in what the character should be doing, then you will have ego-driven, actor-oriented, actor-driven realizations, which are usually false and in the wrong place. And because of that, it's going to shut the audience down and the audience is not involved in that realization. And we've had an example of both of those in one scene. That is the crux of acting.